Funding for Indian Pride is provided by the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Forest County Potawatomi Tribe, National City, the Otto Bremer Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public. On this episode of Indian Pride, we'll look at treaties and sovereignty, hear a traditional Mohegan story, and enjoy the contemporary music of Mr. Jim Boyd. I'm Junie K. Randall, and welcome to Indian Pride. Most people don't realize that treaties between the United States government and Indian nations are binding contracts. Indian Pride examines some of these treaties and their impact on our country and Indian nations today. Here in Connecticut, as in many other places, we had an enormous amount of encroachment, particularly on the Royal Mohegan Burial Ground in Norwich. And the only way we were allowed to legally petition and sue was if we were non-reservation Indians. So the tribe agreed to sacrifice the reservation and own their land individually as individuals if they had a chance to regain that burial ground. It was about a 400-year effort. And over that 400-year time, we were denied in court half a dozen times. On March 7th, 1994, we received our federal recognition. And when we did, it was a very snowy day. And we went down to Shantuck which is where our burial ground is. And the first thing we did was thank our ancestors. Then we went to Mohegan Church, which was our reservation, and we rang the bell. They officially split the tribe, and then we were allotted on the southern part of the reserve around Topeka. And so we became a landless tribe. We were drafting our first tribal statutes, first code, first set of laws. The issue of sovereignty wasn't really clear to us, and there was almost an epiphany. Our sovereignty doesn't depend on the recognition of the United States. We were a sovereign before there was the United States. The only way that you can be a sovereign is to exercise your sovereignty. You have inherent rights as a government that preceded those of the United States, but unless you establish a body of law, a constitution and a body of statutes, and take the perspective in the way the government behaves and take on the responsibilities as well as the privileges. Sovereignty doesn't depend on someone else recognizing your sovereignty. It's when you as a people recognize your ability to govern yourself. Somebody came up with a new title to separate the Indians out, just like long ago, you know, it was the civilized tribes and the uncivilized tribes, the savages and the hang around the Fort Indians. Now it's the recognized Indians and the unrecognized Indians. That's a good divider because now even the recognized tribes are saying, oh, we can't deal with you guys because you're unrecognized. It becomes more and more important because everybody, everybody you deal with says, ah, oh, you're not federal recognized, like that's a bad thing. You know, it's like, oh, what is that? Is, is that a blemish on my face? Or how'd you, how'd you know? You know, is this basket not real? Or are, are, are these sacred places not real sacred places? Or, you know, are repatriated bodies are not Indian people? What does that actually mean? We don't believe that recognition creates Indian tribes. Recognition or no recognition, assistance or no assistance, it doesn't seem to change us in that job that we have been given by the Creator for our territories that we take care of. I think there's a misconception among a lot of Americans about the relationship between tribes and the federal government. And they think that somehow the federal government has given sovereignty to tribes. The federal government, no one else gave tribes sovereignty. They were sovereign long before there was a U.S. federal government. The driving force for Indian people is to not lose any more than they've already lost. Treaties with American Indian tribes date all the way back to the founding of our great nation. These original treaties are equivalent to the ones negotiated today with our allies. I believe it is of critical importance 
that Americans understand the basis for the unique relationship that exists between tribes and the federal government. For that reason, Indian Pride has invited Mr. John Echohawk, the Executive Director of the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder, Colorado, to help us understand Indian treaties and tribal sovereignty. Welcome to Indian Pride, John. Thanks, Junie Kay. It's good to be here. John, would you please define for us what a treaty is? Well, treaties are uh, legal agreements between nations, uh, sovereign nations, and so uh, what is an Indian tribe then, since Indian tribes are signatories to these treaties? Uh, tribes are nations, they're sovereign nations. And of course, uh, a sovereign nation has authority to uh, exercise self-government and uh, uh, make decisions on behalf of its, uh, of its people. And that's what Indian nations have been doing since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. uh, so, when, so when did we uh, finally have the first treaty that had that legal uh, bind with the United States government? Well, of course, the uh, Constitution uh, of this uh, country was adopted in 1787, and uh, it incorporated this process of, uh, of uh, uh, negotiating treaties with Indian tribes because that was a process that had uh, gone back clear to 1492, the first Euro European contact. The Europeans eventually came to recognize that uh, our tribes were, uh, were nations and dealt with our tribes through treaties. And right. this was the case all the way up to 1787. It was a practice that was then picked up and adopted in uh, incorporated into the Constitution and the way this country dealt with uh, uh, our nation's Indian tribes. One of the questions that I always had, John, was if the tribes could not speak English, how did they negotiate these treaties? Well, oftentimes in these, uh, in these treaty proceedings, there were, there were interpreters uh, that, uh, uh, you know, basically interpreted the white man's word into uh, um, you know, the languages our, our people could understand and then our people recited back and that was interpreted back and through that very difficult process uh, th these, these, treaties, these treaties came out and as, as you might guess, none of them are all that long, they're, they're fairly brief, fairly short, fairly concise, but it had to go through this translation process. How many treaties are we talking about when they first started to uh, sign treaties? Well, there are uh, hundreds of treaties uh, that were signed between Indian tribes and the United States government. Uh, most of those treaties have been uh, changed over the years in one, one form or another uh, by the federal government. The federal government uh, claims the power to abrogate or change these treaties uh, with or without the consent of the tribes, and they have done that to most of these treaties. But the key significant element of those treaties uh, the fact that they recognize the sovereign status of our people as, as uh, self-governing nations, that part remains. Is it true that part of the treaties uh, in, included the language that they would take care of the Indian tribes with health, education, and welfare? Tell me a little bit about that, because that applies today to a lot of tribes. Well, there, there were uh, all kinds of provisions included in these treaties. Uh, you know, they were basically meant to not only resolve the, the uh, uh, land issues that, uh, that were there, but also to provide the future for a relationship between the federal government and the tribal nations. And, you know, the tribes bargained for the things that they need, and oftentimes they uh, revolved around issues relating to uh, health, uh, education, and welfare, and that those provisions found their way into uh, to many of these treaties and then were uh, carried out through uh, various acts of Congress implementing those treaties and right. many of those provisions remain in effect today. So um, d tell us what sovereignty means. How does that apply to the treaties? Well sovereignty uh, you know is, is you know the uh, uh, description of, of what a of what a nation is. It's a, a, a sovereign uh, government uh, that's the right of the people then as uh, citizens of that government to make their own decisions, uh, control their own land, and uh, conduct uh, government to government relationships with other governments. And that's what uh, tribes do today. They have uh, 
relationships with the federal government that's uh, conducted on a government to government basis and also with the state governments there are intergovernmental agreements that occur between tribal governments and state governments uh, and it's such that today our federal system uh, is composed of three governments the federal government the state governments and the tribal governments and that's all based on the Indian treaties. Uh, do uh, states have um, legal course over uh, federally recognized tribes within their states or how does that uh, work out when they're both sovereign? Well the, the United States Constitution establishes uh, that the uh, relationship between the tribes and the federal government is an exclusive relationship. It's a federal power that exists within the federal government to deal exclusively with the Indian tribes. So the states have no role in, uh, in the uh, relationships with Indian tribes unless somehow that's been agreed to by a treaty or by an act of Congress. And without that, then the states really have no authority in Indian affairs. So we currently have around 562 federally recognized tribes. Are all these tribes independently sovereign? Yes, they are. They're recognized as uh, sovereign Indian nations uh, by the federal government and as such then they, they carry out these uh, government to government relationships with the federal government and execute these uh, intergovernmental agreements, have relationships with the, uh, with the states, uh, you know, whatever may be allowed under the treaties or, or federal law. And uh, again, this is the, the state of, uh, of the uh, uh, federal system of governance uh, in this country today, federal, state, and tribal. Uh, finally, one of the questions that I, I think is important is, what does it mean to hold land into trust? What kind of trust responsibility does the federal government have uh, for the Indian people or Indian nations? Well, one of the things that, that happened uh, in the history of this country and the history of uh, tribes and the federal government was that uh, the land that our people reserved unto themselves in the treaties uh, was taken into trust for them uh, by the federal government. Uh, and this means then the government is our trustee. They uh, hold the legal title to our land in trust for us as, uh, as beneficiaries. And this trust relationship then means that the federal government is supposed to conduct itself as a trustee it's got fiduciary relationships to make sure that it deals with uh, our people and our land in a, in a special way that uh, protects our rights and obligates them to uh, conduct our affairs uh, dealing with our land in a, in a, in a responsible way. And uh, it also conducts uh, or subjects them to uh, liability in, in the case of uh, mismanagement of our lands. And of course, that gets us into many of the uh, uh, big issues of the day. The Cabell case is all over, so tell us a little bit about the case uh, that you're currently working on. Well, this uh, Cobell case is uh, uh, filed on behalf of Eloise Cabell, uh, a Blackfeet uh, Indian woman, and 500,000 other uh, individual Native Americans who are uh, owners of uh, individual Indian lands in this country that are held in trust by the federal government. Uh, uh, holding these lands and trusts obligates, obligates the federal government then to uh, uh, manage these lands and the funds generated from these lands as a trustee. And one of the duties of a trustee is to provide a legal accounting of the funds generated from that land. Well, the federal government has never done that since uh, this system was set up in 1887. Uh, this Cobell litigation has established that the government owes this legal accounting and is now requiring the government to provide that accounting. And uh, since they never uh, kept very good records, then they're struggling to get that accounting completed. Well, the subject of Indian treaties and sovereignty are not completely understood, but you've certainly given us a chance, John, to better understand these topics. Thank you for being with us today in Indian Pride, and we're very proud of all the work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Junie Kay. Thanks for having me. Many years ago, one of our Mohegan elders had made a basket, and he decided to walk into the next village to give it to one of his relatives. As he was walking along, he became quite thirsty. Fortunately, he passed by a stream, so he stooped to get some water. 
but his thirst was so great that the water would not quench it. And he kept walking and walking. And soon he passed by a farmyard, and there was a farmer making apple cider. Good, said the Mohegan to himself. Cider, just what I need. Cider will surely quench my thirst. So he approached the farmer and said, Please, I am so thirsty. Could you possibly give me some of that cider to drink? Well, the farmer did not want to give the Mohegan elder any cider. However, he did not want to be accused of saying no either. So he said, sure, I'll give you some cider. I'll give you as much cider as you're able to carry with you in your basket. Well, the Mohegan elder took one look at the farmer and another look at his basket and decided he would teach the farmer a lesson. Fortunately, it was a very cold day. He wanted to teach this lesson without saying anything mean or striking at the farmer. So he had passed by that stream and he went back to the stream and he took his basket and he put it in the stream, swished it around and held it up to the cold air. He took his basket again, put it in the stream, swished it around and held it up to the cold air. Over and over and over, he kept taking the basket, putting it into the stream and holding it up to the cold air. And gradually ice formed on the bottom of the basket. And the Mohegan elder went back to the farmer, and the farmer gave him some cider. Now we tell this story to our children for two reasons. One, if you're in a terrible situation, there's generally a way of handling it rather than striking out at the individual. And two, listen to and respect your elders, for they have been on this earth a long time and can help us in many, many ways. To button me. Our special musical guest today is Mr. Jim Boyd, who comes to us from the Colville Tribe in Washington State. His many credits include the soundtrack for the Sherman Alexie movie, Smoke Signals. With a hella, 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 with a hella, hella, ho. With a hella, 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 with a hella, hella, ho. With a hella, 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 with a hella, hella, ho. With a hella, 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 with a hella, hella, ho. I'm a Carville tribal Indian, and I come from Inchlim. From the lakes banned by the river, across the border we begin. And my people fished the waters till the Columbia turned the lake. And Grand Coulee took the salmon as my people's heart would break. Grand Coulee flooded in Chilim, we were forced to relocate. Way to hell, I hell, I hell, I way to hell, I hell, I ho. Way to hell, I hell, I hell, I way to hell, I hell, I ho. Way to hell, I hell, I hell, I way to hell, I hell, I ho. Way to hell, I hell, I hell, I way to hell, I hell, I ho. I was raised in politics of times that tried to terminate our existence as a people, yet we're here to reinclocate. I feel strength among my people as their blood runs strong through me, and my children and their children will be proud of who they'll be. Yeah, my children and their children can be proud of who they'll be. With a hell, I hell, I hell, I with a hell, I hell, I ho. With a hell, I hell, I hell, I with a hell, I hell, I ho. With a hell, I hell, I hell, I with a hell, I hell, I ho. With a hell, I hell, I hell, I with a hell, I hell, I ho. Now, insulin is calling, so I follow by demand. Yeah, insulin is calling, it's the place it all began. And I love it there forever, yeah, no matter where I go. Inchalim is in my heart, and the people there are in my soul. Where the hell I, hell I, hell I, where the hell I, hell I go. With a hell I hell I hell I with a hell I hell I ho With a hell I hell I hell I with a hell I hell I ho 
Way to hell, I hell, I hell, I way to hell, I hell, I hell. I'm a Carville tribal Lynchman, and I come from Mitchell From the lakes bent by the river, across the border we began. Now I travel across the country, playing my guitar, singing songs that I've written about my people and the place where I belong. Yeah, I write about my people and the place where they belong. Where the hell I hell I hell I where the hell I hell I ho Where the hell I hell I hell I where the hell I hell I ho Where the hell I hell I hell I where the hell I hell I ho Where the hell I hell I hell I where the hell I hell I ho 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 Sometimes, Father, you and I are like a three-legged horse who can't get across the finish line. No matter how hard he tries and tries and tries. And sometimes, Father, you and I are like a warrior who can only paint half of his face while the other half cries and cries and cries and cries and cries. Now can I ask you, Father, if you know how much farther we have to go? Now can I ask you, Father, do you know how much farther we need to go? Father and Father, Father and Father, yeah, till we know. Father and Father, yeah, how much farther? Till we know. Sometimes, Father, you and I are like two old drunks who spend their whole lives in the bars, swallowing down all those lies and lies and lies. And sometimes, Father, you and I are like dirty ghosts who wear the same sheets every day. As one more piece of us just dies and dies and dies. Now can I ask you, Father, if you know how much farther we have to go, yeah. Now can I ask you, Father, do you know how much farther we need to go? Father and Father, Father and Father, yeah, till we know. Father and Father, Father and Father, until we know. Father and Father, Father and Father, yeah, yeah, until we know. Father and Father, yeah, how much Father, until we know. Give me rock, oh Ranico, Ranico, hey, 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 no way. Which it give me rock, oh Ranico, oh Ranico, hey, hey, no way. What a spirit feeling spinning around my head makes me feel glad that I'm not dead. Which it Ta, give me rock, ho ra ni go, ho ra ni go, hey, ne, hey, ne, no way. Which it ta, ta, give me rock, ho ra ni go, ho ra ni go, hey, ne, hey, ne, no way. What a spirit feeling spinning around my head makes me feel glad that I'm not dead. Sometimes, Father, you and I are like a three-legged horse who can't get across the finish line. No matter how hard he tries and tries and tries. I'd 
like to thank all of our special guests for sharing their gifts and talents. We invite you to join us next time as we present another great showcase of Indian pride. And whenever you get a chance, do something kind for a child. Bye-bye for now. Funding for Indian Pride is provided by the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Forest County Potawatomi Tribe, National City, the Otto Bremer Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public.